Alliance are an organisation that supports faculty and graduate students a year with their applications to Oxford and Cambridge. And now I'm editing and that's the Dean of Aston Office, supporting that many students so, uh, and a network of about 1,800 students. So, Lots and lots of experience about Oxbridge. So I'm going to start right at the very, very beginning and uh, just have a little bit of a chat about what, uh, what the difference is between the two universities and what it's like. Uh, so here we have uh, both Cambridge and Oxford. The first thing to notice is the first thing to notice is um, there is not a central university. There is it's not uh, in a traditional sense. Um, you can be walking around Oxford uh, all the time, or Cambridge, and people will say, thanks guys, have a seat. Um, people will say, where is the university? And you kind of have to point all around you and say, it's everywhere. In a similar way to if you ask someone from the United States where they're from, they'll probably give you their state first, and then the fact that they're from, a, from, the, um, from the US. It's very similar. So you talk about your college a lot more than you talk about the university itself. So at Oxford, there are 37 colleges, and slightly less at Cambridge, um, around the 30 mark, uh, if you include graduate colleges and things like that, and they are dotted all over the town, so um, location can be a factor for people when they're deciding which one of those uh, colleges they're going to apply for. Um, not all colleges have all subjects, there's a variety of different things you can look at, uh, but that's kind of to give you a general address of how, uh, kind of where, where it all starts. So how are they different to other universities? Um, obviously, they're quite famous universities, but there is a reason behind that. They're the oldest universities. Actually, the subject that I study, theology, is the oldest subject that um, there is to study. Uh, and it started at Oxford many, many years ago. I've talked a little bit already about the collegiate system. That means that you live there. So you live in your college. Um, you, sometimes you live there all three years. Uh, you might live out for a couple of years or uh, near your college, but that's very much where your social life is formed. It's um, if you're going to be part of a sports club, it's likely that you'll be part of the college sports club before you join the university one. Um, your teaching tends to happen either in college or at the faculty of that, that subject that you're studying. Um, but it's very much that your college runs your, your life, as it were. It's where you're going to have build a family of friends over your three or four years. Um, so if we're just looking at undergrad colleges, there's 31 in Oxford and 29 in Cambridge. Um, there are graduate colleges as well, which is why um, you might see higher numbers. Uh, but that's kind of all the, the different places that you have to choose from. The key difference is the teaching. So the teaching style at Oxford and Cambridge is different because it's one-to-one, -one, or two-to-one maybe. Uh, and it's a, something called the tutorial system. So you might, in, uh, particularly in the humanities, you will write an essay or you'll solve a, write a problem sheet maybe for things like philosophy or economics and you will sit in uh, a room with that tutor and you'll discuss the subject one-to-one uh, -one in that very kind of familiar environment. You'll also have lectures available to you at the, the central faculties at the university but the, the key difference and what makes Oxford and Cambridge really special is that tutorial system. You also get short terms, so uh, eight weeks. Your terms are eight weeks. Most people go up in something called North Week, so they literally number the, the weeks. Um, and you might stay into Ninth Week, but in general, you have eight weeks there, and then you get long holidays at home when you might be um, working on, on revising or using it to go away on long holidays or spending time with your family who you, you've missed and eating from the fridge again after kind of living on student food while you've uh, been away. So short term, shorter terms than other universities. So, um, should, should you be thinking about applying? Uh, I'm just going to talk first about the raw academic requirements um, before I talk about the other reasons you might want to apply. Generally, there's a general rule, there's about five A stars um, at GCSE. That is not a hard and fast rule. I've seen people be accepted with much less. I've seen people be rejected with a lot more. Um, but these are just kind of the typical offers that you're looking at. In general, it's about three A's, um, but it can go up to a, a star, A star, A. Or I saw someone this year be offered three A stars and an A. Um, it, it really does vary, but don't, don't let that put you off if, if that's um, a consideration because they really do take into account um, it's actually done on, on where your, the average results of your school, so there's a, there's a huge kind of disparity there. Uh, but these are just some example offers that we have from people who um, we worked with last year. Um, really, kind of, you can see the, the variety of different offers that people got for different subjects. Um, all at different colleges and um, maybe some subjects that you're not even familiar with up there as well. So um, 
the entry requirements on a purely academic point are of course quite rigorous um, it, they are the, the best universities in terms of academics that could have regarded as that um, certainly in the UK if not the world but grades are only one part of that journey they're looking for much more um, do you have potential do you have academic ability are you someone that loves to read are you someone that um, really is passionate about your subject beyond just your, your A-level syllabus and um, have you got motivation? Um, are you someone that if you give the, if you have a topic, you're going to go and read a hundred more things about it because you're so ex immediately excited about it? Um, one of our admissions tutors that works with us always uses the example of Egyptology. If you're going to study Egyptology, you've got to love Egyptology so much that you wake up in the morning and you're thinking about Egyptology. You go to sleep at night and you're thinking about Egyptology. So. Um, that, that kind of real curiosity to learn more about your subject. And is there a good fit between you and the course? That's kind of for you to decide first before the university gets to decide. The courses can be really quite different. Um, there's a variety of different course choices that I'll go into in a second. But they're, um, you need to be happy and comfortable uh, in the course that you're going to be just choosing. The courses are quite different. They can be quite intense, quite um, academically challenging. So you've got to make sure it's the kind of course that you want to do. Famously, Oxford and Cambridge have less kind of um, choi uh, multiple disciplines. So Oxford has more than Cambridge. There are about 87 courses to choose from at Oxford, um, and slightly less at Cambridge. But at some universities, you can study maths and kind of and insert any other subject. At, at Oxford and Cambridge, it's a lot more limited on the kind of things you can do, which might not be for you. You might want to try to study two completely random subjects together, um, and that's kind of also where the US fits in um, with the kind of option of uh, majors and minors. There is um, a, a sense of vocational commitment you'll need to show. So if you want to go for medicine or if you want to go for law, um, vet med, uh, things like architecture as well, they're not just looking for whether you'll be good at that subject, they're looking for whether you'll make a great doctor one day or a great lawyer one day. Um, so keeping that in mind when you're applying uh, for those subjects. Uh, so a quick quiz to kind of keep the room moving. Uh, these people all attended Oxbridge, and I just wondered if you can tell me who they are and what you reckon they might study. They normally go first. Who's that? David Attenborough, yeah. Any ideas what he might study? No, not quite. Natural Sciences at Cambridge. Um, so there's two different nat natural sciences courses at Cambridge, physical and biological. Um, they kind of obviously physics versus biology groups, and that's what he did, the biological group. Who's that? Does anyone know? Yes, Margaret Thatcher. Any ideas what she studied? The picture's a bit of a hint. Chemistry. Yes, she studied chemistry. She actually, interestingly, got rejected initially for a scholarship. She couldn't afford to go. Um, rejected going to college for a scholarship, and then later someone dropped out, so she got their place. So, um, who knows? The Conservative Party might have been different had that not happened. Uh, anyone know who these guys are? I don't know if you watch. Yes, Mel and Sue. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and they actually met at Cambridge. Um, studying languages and English, uh, and they joined something called the Footlights, which is quite a famous society in Cambridge, it's a comedy society, so they met there. Anyone know who that is? No. She's an actress, Naomi Harris. Uh, she's been in things like X-Men, um, like lots of things, yeah, like things like that. Um, and she went to, actually studied HSPS, which stands for um, Human, Social and Political Sciences, uh, which is a really varied course where you can study everything from anthropology, politics, sociology, even bits of psychology. So really, really varied course that she studied there, but definitely got into her acting while she was there. Anyone know who that is? No, author. It's Tolkien. So, uh. uh, he studied classics and then English at Oxford. Um, famously, uh, good friends with C.S. Lewis, he used to hang out in the pub. Um, on a, on a famous pub on St Giles, which is a central street in Oxford. And Stephen, Stephen Hawking, Stephen do you know what he studied? Physics. Do you know where he studied? He studied at both. So Oxford, then Cambridge. So Cambridge is where he kind of went on to his PhD and stuff. He started at Oxford, he started in Glasgow. So I'm not sure where he's at. Um, okay, so thanks for getting involved in that one. Uh, moving on from like wh whether you should be thinking of applying, if you decide to, and you decide it's the right thing for you, what can you do to maximise your chances? Um, the first thing is choosing your course. So a lot of times I spend, um, I probably do about 300 interviews a year, 
and the majority of those have been the subjects that are on here, which you may or may not understand, which is medicine, PPE, or economics and uh, law. And um, all too often I sit down and I say, why do you want to study medicine? Or a better example, why do you want, why do you want to study uh, law? Because I want to be a very successful lawyer. Why do you want to study uh, economics? Because I want to be a banker. It's not necessarily natural that you have to study that subject as an undergrad course in order to be able to end up doing these things. This is from the Waterfall of Wall Street. He's meant to be a banker. I don't know if that was obvious in the bridge. Um, there's loads of different ways that you can get into these subjects. So, for example, if you to medicine, you could do biological sciences, human sciences, um, natural sciences, a ton of different things, the biology, chemistry, that you don't necessarily need to apply for medicine the first time around. You'll actually only have to take, add one year to your entire degree. And you might figure out after those three years that you don't actually fancy being a doctor after all anyway. Um, or you'll, you'll find that course. Law, I mean, plenty of people that study theology with me ended up in law. You can study maths and do a conversion into law. You can study whatever you want. So you don't necessarily um, feel like you have to, your, your, your path is structured by your course choice. And especially for economics and PPE, you don't need to study the subjects to be a banker. Uh, you can study your, pretty much anything to grind up in those, in those careers. So uh, just keep that in mind when you do your course, because there are almost certainly more than you think. Um, history of art, fine art, archaeology and anthropology. This one's a really popular one um, with, once we tell people about it. It's a combination of law and economics. And people are like, oh, that sounds great, but I've never heard of it. So Landek at Cambridge, it's only available at Cambridge uh, at the moment. But it's a really great subject, but not that everyone turns out to it. EP, which is kind of, um, yeah, it's, it's psychology basically, but with more of a science element. So if you're interested in the biology of the brain or things like that, EP could be a great choice. And combination subjects like classics and English, PPE, philosophy and theology, Loads and loads of different combos as well. So I really encourage you to take a look at all the courses that are available and not just the mainstream ones that you might have heard of. Uh, maths and stats, um, or maths and philosophy, one of my um, team members is maths and philosophy. Um, and there's yeah, a ton of different, different courses that you can choose from. I talked briefly earlier about colleges. I'm just going to do very quickly, just go through um, a little bit about colleges. So you can see here, they might look similar. And these ones probably look a little bit more different. But uh, there are a ton of different colleges to choose from. Any colleges that anyone's heard of? Any colleges? St. John's. St. John's, right? Yeah. Jesus. Jesus, yeah. There's a Jesus at Oxford and Cambridge. Any others? OK. Normally, like things like Christchurch come up a lot. Um, there's some that have really quite big names, like Magdalen, um, and those colleges are amazing. And you should definitely go and take a look around when you go to the university for any open day. But there are also a ton of other colleges that you might not even have heard of, or might be on the, the further outskirts of town that could be perfect for you. So my college, for example, had 27 people in uh, a year group. Really, really tiny, really, really um, intimate setting. Um, how many people are in your group? Your group? Um, in St John's College, there's about 150 people. Exactly. So completely different, completely, uh, um, completely different community aspect and kind of way of social interaction and things like that. So there are a, a ton of different varieties of um, colleges, both in terms of how modern they are, how much history they have, how they do different traditions. Um, really, really different. So I just really encourage you, if you can get down for some open days, have a look around some colleges, um, try and experience what it would be really like, talk to students that are going there, all really, really great. Okay, and then I'm just going to very quickly run through some other information, which is just understanding the timeline for all of these things. Um, so we are in the 1st of June today, so you've probably already had to think about your course um, and if you haven't, you can start now, and your college, um, if you're doing Work experience, if you are going for a, a vocational subject, getting some work experience in the bag um, is this kind of beginning part of the year. Uh, and then right from April, we normally say to start this focused independent study. So really start to work out what it is in your subject that you're passionate about, what your niche is, what, what it is that's going to set you apart from other candidates. What is it that's about history that makes you really excited? I had an interview with someone yesterday who I said, you know, pick any period of history, what's most exciting? He said, oh, Roman military history in the third century. I was like, great, completely random, but he's really passionate about it. And then he could talk about books that he'd read and, you know, he really brought that to life. So find something that you're passionable about. Um, it doesn't need to be the mainstream, it can be whatever you want. 
Um, obviously you'll get your results in August and that might affect your choices. You might find, oh actually maybe I am better at maths than chemistry or, or things like that. Um, but do continue that fo focused independent study until December. One of, um, so you apply, the deadline is October the 15th for your UCAT application, um, which is when you have to decide which college and which course for DEFA. But you know, it's, during your doing all of that, you can still focus on um, getting that independent study done. And one thing I really recommend is keep a folder of everything that you've read. So if you're reading an article online and you're like, that's really interesting, just print it out and write some notes on it. And then when you get to December, you can just have a flip through all of those things that you've read across the year. And uh, it, should be really, it should be really helpful for you. So there's personal statements to write, so you need to write your personal statement um, and make sure that is up, up to scratch. I don't know if anyone went to the personal statement uh, workshop, uh, but that's a, a good place to start. Um, and then you've got admissions tests. Yeah, previously, only around 60% of students were sitting admissions tests. That's going to go up to 80% this year because Cambridge are introducing a new admissions test. Slightly, so if you're going for history, for example, you'll need to sit the history aptitude test. Um, if you're going for PPE, you'll need to sit the uh, something called the TSA, which is a thinking skills assessment. There's a huge number of these different things out there, so just make sure you really research what it is that your subject requires and then you can work out which test you need to sit. Um, so, you know, you can start that around uh, September. Some, some students start as early as July, um, but the test itself is normally around, last year it was November the 5th, so it's around that time um, that you'd actually be sitting that test. And then the interviews take place. So the interviews take place the first kind of two weeks of December. We do have people going from you know, 27th of November, but around those first two weeks of the no December is when the actual interview takes place. And then I suppose when you find out is the January. So you find out the, in the January. Previously, Oxford used to find out much sooner, but um, now everyone finds out in, in January. So you'll know <laughs> um, fairly soon after um, what the, whether you've been successful or not. Um, so the most things that I probably get asked the most about is um, the Oxbridge interview. Um, I'm sure people have heard of things to do with the interview before. Um, I suppose the first question is, why do you think Oxford and Cambridge bother to interview their students? Does anyone have any thoughts? Why they bother to do that? Select the best students. Yeah, mm. so select the best students. see if you've got the right skills and abilities and intelligence. Yeah, absolutely. So meeting them, meeting the students face to face tells you whether you're going to be um, able to survive in that tutorial environment, so in that one-to-one -one environment, um, and it's going to be um, the right situation for you. So that's why they're doing it. So anyone know who interviews you? Who is it that they? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not me. No, not for. As in, uh, it's the person who does that subject at that college. So they don't wheel out this special admissions tutor at the, in December that kind of sits in a closet for the rest of the year. They are the real people that will be teaching you day in and day out. So that's why it's really important that it's them, because they'll be the ones teaching you. So you don't need to worry that, oh, they know this and they know that or whatever. It's just that they're going to be the ones teaching you day in and day out. So it's important to remember that for you remember it's a conversation. And what do you think you're being judged on? Any idea? Judged is probably a big word. What do you think you're having a chat about? Character. Character, yeah. Something we call teachability. So do I want to teach this to you? Yeah. Really, you love the subject or not? Yeah, passion and enthusiasm. Yeah, if you genuinely love it. And the last thing is probably a given, but knowledge. Just to see if you've got the core skills that would be able to get through. But they're about in that third. You know, knowledge isn't everything. Uh, it's how much, how much you can get involved in an argument sometimes or a discussion and see how that goes. And who gets in? Anyone. There is no fixed Oxford, Oxbridge undergrad. There is no, not a specific formula of this makes the perfect Oxford undergrad. It can be absolutely anyone from any background, from uh, anywhere. Uh, what's important is, are you interested in that subject? Are you teachable? It can be absolutely anything at all. There isn't a stereotypical person that gets in. Um, so just bear that in mind. They're not looking for a pre-made person. They're looking for someone just like you. So this is a real life Oxbridge question. I'm going to start by asking, what subject do you think this question came from? Any guesses? Just throw a guess. Maths. Maths. Any other guesses? Music. No, it could, it could be from hundreds of different subjects. Uh, geography, maybe. Um, but it was actually from a physics interview. Physics one. Um, so how do you think you'd go about approaching that question? What would be the first thing you'd do? Any guesses? No? Okay, 
Well, uh, you would start by breaking down the question into something a bit more manageable. What they're not looking for is for you to sit there, think very quietly for five minutes, and then come out with 732. That's not what they're looking for. What they're looking for is can this person think um, and can they vocalise what they're thinking? So you might say, well, New York's brings to mind lots of pictures of Broadway, so I imagine there's quite a lot of pianos there, and I'm also seeing lots of sky rises when I think of New York. It might be quite difficult to get pianos up sky rises, and then I want to think about how many people are actually in New York, and how many pianos there are per person, and then I think about how many tuners it takes to tune a piano, and how long that is. Do you see what I'm doing there? I'm not, give, yeah, I'm not giving you a fixed answer. I have, I ask this question hundreds of times a year, I have absolutely no idea how many piano tuners there are in New York. It makes no difference. I don't care what answer you get to at the end of it, it's all about the thinking process and how you can get there. This is another one I use really often that's a really popular question with um, tutors because it's not just asking whether you've read recently, it's asking whether you disagree with it, it's asking if you have an opinion on something that you've read recently. So you might say, yeah, I read this article last week um, in The Economist and it's talking about how Brexit is a really great thing and I just totally disagree with it and these are the reasons why I disagree with it. Do you see how that brings to life the question? Makes It's actually a gift of a question because you can talk about whatever you want. They're not saying, you know, how many atoms in my pen. They're giving you completely free reign to talk about whatever you want. So it's not about being prepared for a specific question. That's what I'm trying to get at is that it's it's being prepared for anything is the, the best place to start. Great. Um, so in summary, we're kind of talking about where you are in, in the process and if you're working out if it's the right thing for you. Definitely check out those open days. If you get a chance to go and visit either of the universities, that would be amazing. Looking at other universities that um, are interesting to you and working out how the courses fit in with that. Then summer, you're going to be writing a personal statement and redrafting a personal statement until it's ready. And then you submit your UCAS form in the 15th of October, um, preparing for that admissions test that I talked about. Written work is something that some subjects require, so being aware of that. Preparing for your interview, and then actually having it, um, and seeing seeing how you get on. So that's kind of a general scope for looking at this. The immediate priorities that you should be thinking about right now are, what do I want to study? Why do I want to study it? And where do I want to study? So you might have sat here and been like, oh, I can't believe that anything worse than sitting one-to-one -one with my tutor every week. That sounds awful. Great, you worked out that the type of <laughs> Oxford Cambridge is not the type of university for you for humanities. You might have sat here and thought, oh, I do not want a college. I do not want to be in a college system. Oxford Cambridge is not for you. That's brilliant because what you're doing is narrowing down your choices and you're working out what isn't for you. So that's as important as working out where you do want to study. So those are kind of three questions you should be thinking about at the moment. Uh, begin looking at the prospectuses, they're a really good place to start. I've seen a few people have picked some up today, but all the ones that you definitely want to get. Um, and carry out your extra reading, get excited about something in the subject of your interests. Um, open days already talked about. If you want any more help, we offer a ton of free resources on the website. There are reading lists on there, there are real life interview questions on there, there are blogs every week. Literally, there's a huge wealth of resources, and it's all written by Oxbridge grads. We um, have a mission to kind of be able to touch every application at some point to support it in some way. So, definitely give us a call. We're available for free on the phone anytime. Um, so, if you need help, definitely um, get involved. And then, just questions. Anyone got questions? Maybe I'll just hang around afterwards. I know you've been hanging around with us. Yeah, I'm happy to. Um, just to add it, obviously, you are very welcome to use up to the applications. They are not kind of affiliated with the universities in any way. They, they are a kind of separate organisation, just to make that yeah. clear. And there's a lot of uh, free information also on both websites yeah. to look at, and as well as visit. So just to there. There's but if you have any there. questions, I'm yeah, happy to. I've got a question. In the admissions session you were talking about, how long is there? Does, is there a pass or fail kind of thing? Do you find out straight away? You don't find out straight away. You can sit the exam at the beginning of November. Okay. and. Um, the, the result kind of comes to the university first, and that's how they make their selection. It's a fixed mark normally. It depends on the test. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a fixed mark. Um, Which is roughly what kind of is it percentage? What kind of it completely varies on the different tests. So mm -hmm. some subjects are looking for a specific mark. Mm -hmm. The TSA is set actually by seven different subjects, so they might be looking for different marks depending on what subject it is. Um, and then they will make the decision based on that and a number of other things. 
So there's a lot of information on, on the website as well. So for example, for the, for the BMAP test for medicine, you can go and look at, and I'll show you for previous years, what has been the cut-off mark, which is a good um, thing to look at. But for some, there's not a specific mark they, um, that they use, but you, yeah, you can ask for your result post. You need to pass it, basically, to get accepted, don't yeah. you? Yeah, but it's not necessarily that the pass mark will be, you know, things like you've been doing in school where you think the pass mark is, it could be a much lower pass mark yeah. and it depends on that particular year. Um, mm -hmm. It's only one of the things looked at in context of, of lots of other things as well. So um, yeah, and definitely I would go at some of the past papers which are online mm -hmm. um, under like time conditions because mm -hmm. timing can be an issue. Yeah. There's a ton of, um, there's actually a website specifically designed, like an independent website specifically designed just to help with um, the emissions test. So you can click on it and it will give you literally, this is how long, what a paper looks like, this is how long it is, Literally everything. So, uh, uh, if you just Google the admissions tests, okay. it'll come up. And there's still the ATS admissions testing service, yeah. which, um, yeah. but you, if it's the BMAT, then you want to go to that one. If it's the LNAT law, then it'll be that one. So, okay. um, if you look on the last one line, there'll be links to kind of information about the test, and you can, there's free tests that you can do online to have a go at if you want to just get a feel for. Um, you don't have to revise lots and lots for the tests, um, it's more testing your potential the way you think, but it is nice to have a go at them so you know the timing for the test. Any other, I mean, what I'll do is I'll hang around at the end and then people can ask any questions there. And thank you so much for coming to the talk. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much.